This clip will explain what necessary and sufficient conditions are and how we will use them. In mathematics and therefore in some economic problems we'll need these sorts of contact, uh, concepts to solve problems often to prove certain things. So let's uh, start out with what we would sometimes call what a logical implication is. In mathematics we use this double arrow to represent a logical implication. So we'd say P implies Q. So what's that mean is that if P is true then Q is true. You can also formulate that the other way around. Q is true if P is true. Either way what this says in words is that P is sufficient for Q. As soon as you know that P, P is true, you know that Q is true. So here are a few examples. Let's start with a mathematical one. Let's say P and Q are represented with the P uh, with the blue and green highlighter. So let's go to our example. P the green the blue statement is x equals four, and that implies that x squared is equal to 16. Next example, Becca rides a bike to school. That implies that Becca has a bike. So mm, important here is that her bike. Okay, so Becca rides her bike to school implies she has a bike. Next example, David got 50% in his advanced maths exam. And that implies that David passed the course. And lastly, Manchester City scores two more goals than Liverpool in a match. That implies that Manchester City beat Liverpool. So this is a very important concept, Lot a logical implication. P implies Q. So sufficient conditions provide a guarantee that something is true, as in our examples. However, it's important to realize that it is impossible to make the implication the other way around. So we said Becca rides her bike to school implies that Becca has a bike. However, Becca has a bike does not necessarily imply that she also rides her bike to school. So Becca has a bike is not a sufficient condition for Becca rides a bike to school because it doesn't necessarily imply that. If Becca does not have a bike then the statement Becca rides her bike to school must be false. Becca having a bike is therefore and what we call necessary condition for her to ride her bike to school. So we said her riding her bike to school was a sufficient condition for her to have a bike. However, her having a bike is a necessary condition for her to ride her bike to school. Although he, she may not ride her bike to school but it's necessary for her to do so. So let's go to the to another example here. x squared equals 16. So that was the first example we discussed previously. That was the first of our four examples above. So x squared equals 16 does not necessarily imply that x is 4. However, if x squared is not equal to 16, then x equals 4 is impossible. So that means that x squared is actually a necessary condition for x to be true. Although it doesn't necessarily imply that x is equal to 4. So why is that? Well, because x squared equals 16 
would also be true if x is negative 4. Okay, so it's always important to understand which direction the argument goes here. So if p implies q, then q is a necessary condition for p. And that means if q is not true, then p is not true. So if p is a sufficient condition for q, x equals 4 is a sufficient condition for x squared equals 16, then q is a necessary condition for p, i.e. x squared equals 16 is a necessary condition for p, x equals 4. So let's continue with uh, equivalence, which is related to necessary and sufficient conditions in a very particular way. If two events or outcomes are equivalent, we use this double arrow in both directions. And then we say that Q is true if and only if P is true and the other way around or vice versa. Vice versa meaning the other way around. So P implies Q and Q implies P will lead to P and Q being equivalent or Q being true if and only if P is true. So we said before Q is true if P, that means P is sufficient for Q and that was P and then the arrow towards Q. All right, so P is sufficient for Q and if in, in addition Q is true only if P is true then P, in which case P is necessary for Q, then we have this equivalence condition. Then the arrow goes in both directions. So this is often very confusing, and I understand that. Right? So you need to practice a little bit with certain arguments. So here's a statement. All wood burns, therefore everything that burns is wood. Intuitively, you will realize that that is not true. So this is sort of an equivalent statement. Wood and then everything that burns is wood. So question is, is wood and everything that burns, is that equivalent? So let's try and, and uh, bring that into our that little example in our mathematical statement. So that's one sort of statement. The material is wood. Let's call that P. And the second sort of statement in that sentence is that the material burns. Let's call that Q. So let's think about how P and Q are related. We know that wood burns, so P implies Q. If your material is wood, then it will burn. However, Q does not imply P. If you have something that burns, that does not mean that the material is actually wood, because there's other material that burns. Oil, for instance. And therefore, P and Q are not equivalent. Right? Not every material that burns is wood. So let's use these concepts to talk a little bit about sets. Sets are collections of objects of particular interest or a collection of outcomes of interest. So you can think of uh, sociological, economic, political, mathematical outcomes uh, usually we use numbers, that makes it very obvious, but we will try and imply a practical life example uh, in a moment. So we call O our object of interest, some sort of outcome. Uh, so to put life into this, imagine that O means it's an outcome or state of the world where you can use your phone, your mobile phone. Well, we know how important that is for us these days. And so let's think about some set of conditions which are sufficient for O to be true. So what is sufficient for us to be able to use our mobile phone? So if S is met, then O must be true. However, if S is not met, then O is 
merely not guaranteed to be true. So what could S be? S could be, for instance, in this example, that your phone's battery is working or is charged. Your phone's battery is charged. By the way, we assume that the phone is in working order, so it's not a damaged phone. So if your phone is charged, then O is true. Then you can use your phone. S is sufficient for O. Your phone's battery being charged is sufficient for you to be able to use your phone. So why is it true that if S is not met, so if your battery is not charged, that O is just not guaranteed to be true? Well, there could be circumstances where your battery is flat, but you can still use your phone. So that means S is not necessary for O. So what could these circumstances be? This could be where you actually have a cable and you can connect your phone to a power supply or you have a power bank which sort of bypasses or makes your phone's battery unnecessary. So what would then be a set of conditions which is necessary for O? So that must be a broader condition. So we could formulate that as follows. N, a set of conditions is necessary for O if is, for instance, if you have a power source. So that could be your battery, your phone's battery, but it could also be a power block or a battery bank. So let's think about some a little bit more mathematical notation to represent these situations. X is sort of an outcome or state of the world, which could be in either of these sets, S, O or N. So X and then this funny E, or element of S. So if X is element of S, that means the state of the world is that your battery is charged, then you can use your phone. Then X will also be element of O. Okay, so if your phone's battery is charged, you can use your phone. This is this case with the little green asterisk. So we can use Venn diagrams to represent the situation. The situation where your phone's battery is charged, that's the S, the sufficient condition, is a subset of this larger set where you can use your phone. We also say S is a subset of O. So this little N on the side with a bar underneath is mathematical notation for S is subset of O. So let's think about that second relationship here, O being a subset of N. This is what this means, O is a subset of N. What's that mean? That means that uh, firstly let me just write that down to make that clear, this mathematical symbol here means is subset of. In some sense, you can think about this because it looks similar. Okay, so I'll put that in inverted commas. You can think that this means smaller than. S is smaller than O or S is contained in O. Okay, but it looks a little bit similar, smaller than equal to. So let's go to the second statement here. And the third, so perhaps the third is the most interesting one. If X is not part of N, so if we are in a state where we do not have a power source of any kind, then we are not in O, then we cannot use our phone. That means N is actually necessary for O. If we don't have a power source, then we can't use our phone. So students of mine in the advanced mathematics course, you should now go to Piazza and look at quizzes two and three for lecture zero, which are two additional examples where you can test your understanding of necessary and sufficient conditions.